The worse the road, the better the destination. An essay by Matt Ruby. That's me. I'm a traveler, a road dog, a backpacker. I've spent decades taking trips around the world to countries in Europe, South America, Asia, and Africa. Along the way, I've learned some valuable travel secrets, and here are 10 of them. Number one, shoulder season is the time to go. Peak season is for suckers. You want May, not August. It's cheaper, it's not as hot, and you don't have to compete with tour buses. There's a life lesson there too. When the mob zigs, you should zag. And a bigger point, don't give crowds and lines that much credit. People who can't think for themselves actually crave waiting in line. It offers social proof they're not making a bad decision. By doing what everyone else is doing, they're really kind of just trying to minimize risk. Unfortunately, living this way results in being constantly surrounded by a bunch of other sheep who also can't think for themselves. We need to see the Mona Lisa. Fine, you can wait two hours to catch a glimpse of her smile or whatever that is from across the street. Or you can skip it, go down another hallway and see another piece of art up close that's just as amazing without getting swallowed up by a bunch of selfie stick suckers. Number two, don't plan too much. I say I'm a backpacker because I've often traveled with a backpack, but it's not really about the luggage choice. It's about the attitude that goes along with it. It's about not following itineraries that are planned way in advance. Instead, you buy a ticket, arrive, find a place to stay for the night, and figure it out from there. The only real plan is to keep updating and adjusting your plan based on real-time information. Does that Aussie couple in your hostel know about a waterfall, a cooking class, or a monastery in the north that's supposed to be amazing? Well, then that's where you're headed next. Take this approach and you realize the silliest thing of all is to attempt to plan an entire trip agenda from home, the place where you have the least information and are actually the most likely to get ripped off since you're not there on the ground. Number three, go to single artist museums and outdoor sculpture gardens. When a museum is devoted to one artist, you get to see their evolution instead of some shuffled playlist of various artists. You get a deep dive into one person's entire discography, or whatever you call it in the art world, when you go to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, the Chagall Museum in Nice, or the Museo Picasso in Barcelona. You see how their artwork evolved over their entire lives, and that context is especially illuminating. Also, go to outdoor sculpture museums in pretty places whenever you can. It's actually a good excuse just to take a day trip. Hop on a train, and usually there's a scenic view along the way, you get there, you get to see some cool art, and it's a great reason to stroll outdoors. My favorites, Fondation Met in Southeast France, Louisiana Museum of Modern Art outside Copenhagen, and Storm King, just outside of New York City. Number four, get off your phone. All right, old man alert here. Lots of my traveling was before smartphones, I admit it. Instead of checking Google Maps, I'd rip out pages from a Lonely Planet guidebook to orient myself and figure out what to do next. Also, there were no cheapo airlines like Ryanair, so I slept on overnight trains, which took forever to reach their destination. And there was no Airbnb. Instead, the ferry landed and a bunch of old ladies waited on the dock holding laminated photos of the apartment they had for rent and then walked you to the place. I get it, technology helps you avoid a lot of hassles nowadays, but when you stick to a TripAdvisor top 10 mindset, you're likely to have a cookie cutter experience. Putting the phone away leads to more randomness and intriguing interactions. These days, I carry a phone when traveling, but I tend to leave it in airplane mode. That way, you get to save money on international fees, you can still use the maps, they work in airplane mode as long as you preload them, and I can always find a cafe with Wi-Fi if I really need to get online. Number five, go one stop further than everyone else. Those extra few hours, they're usually worth it. Isla Holbosch is a real pain to reach. You've got to fly to Cancun, then drive for hours, then you take a ferry, then you get picked up by a golf cart since there are no cars allowed on the island. But then you realize why you put up with all that. Secluded beaches, dusty cabanas, an old town that looks like a movie set, and tiny restaurants on the beach serving fish they just caught. Another one. Everyone hits Machu Picchu. But how many take the extra travel time to reach the moonscape that is the Uyuni Salt Desert in Bolivia? There's no day trip possible to the Ngorongoro crater in Tanzania, but I'll never forget seeing lions play with their cubs there as the sun rose in the background. 
As my friend Deborah put it on that trip, the worse the road, the better the destination. By the way, if you're ever choosing between a place that requires a ferry and one that doesn't, choose the destination that involves a ferry. Just reframe the sailing part of the journey in your mind. A ferry? Yeah, that sounds lame. But a boat ride? That sounds like the sort of thing people would pay extra to experience. Number six, go wild. Tolstoy wrote, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The travel version of that, all cities are alike, but each wild place is wild in its own way. Cities are fueled by commerce, but wild places are fueled by planetary forces. And if you're already a big city resident like I am, you probably need a dose of trees, mountains, and oceans the most. In Argentina, I enjoyed Buenos Aires, but it didn't strike me as wildly dissimilar to other big cities that I've visited. But then I traveled south to Patagonia, where the Andes, glaciers, penguins, gauchos, and rancherias collide. It's only habitable there for a few months out of the year, so when you do get to travel there, you sense you're in this special, mystical place. My memory of Buenos Aires? It's kind of a blur. But I still remember the creaks and moans of the glaciers, the smell of the mountains, and the taste of the beef in Patagonia. Number seven, enjoy your liberation from lawyers. 80% of the world's lawyers live in the USA. We marinate in risk management, waivers, and weird dudes on the highway billboards. It's all kind of infantilizing, really. Elsewhere, you assume your own risk. I crawled through narrow tunnels to reach an underground city in central Turkey. I've gone swimming in all kinds of weird caves and waterfalls. In Bolivia, I took a bike ride down the world's most dangerous road. It's a mountain descent down this narrow cliffside road and a car plunges over the cliff every two weeks or so. And actually a few days before our trip, a cyclist went over the edge. The whole time I kept thinking, there's no way this would ever happen in America. And that was kind of great. Although also slightly terrifying. Anyway, you can decide for yourself how much you want to stay between the lines, but it's refreshing to at least be given the choice. Number eight, see like a photographer. When I travel, I shoot lots of photos. I get some cool shots, but I've come to realize the shooting mindset is what's really valuable. It changes the way I see things and interact with my environment. I notice details in a different way. Walking down the street becomes a full sensory experience. I go out more at dawn or dusk because the light is just right. I get a bird's eye view and climb stairs and towers, and I venture to odd parts of town. I stare closely at shadows, textures, and buildings. When I carry a camera, I just see more. Plus, it's nice to have actual photos, the kind you can collect later in a book. Yeah, that's right, go analog with your prints. In fact, get a book of photos from your trip printed. Because really, no one wants to look at photos on your phone. Plus, you'll keep that book for the rest of your life. Who knows if any of our digital photos will actually still be viewable 30 years from now. Also, don't take the same photo everyone else has taken. You can usually just find that one online. Instead, find a weird angle, zoom in too tight, or do something else that creates a photo only you could have taken. Number nine, turn up your bullshit detector. In Belgium, there's a site popular among tourists called Mannequin Peace. It's a statue of a little boy pissing in a fountain. There's nothing all that pretty or even interesting about it, yet people come from all over the world to take pictures there because, well, it's the thing to do. That's what's in the guidebook, you know? Sometimes there's no way to know until you get there, but sometimes you can read a description and figure it out yourself. It's a statue of a little boy pissing in a fountain? Uh, no thanks. Another example, I once went to this popular quote-unquote tourist destination in southern Vietnam. It was the site of a wartime bombing during the 60s. So a bunch of us hopped on this bus and we drove for hours to get there, and when we arrived we found... Well, it was just a large field with like a slight indent in it. That's it. That was the tourist destination. All right, well played, Vietnam. Look, it was my country that did the bombing, so I guess it was understandable payback. In addition to healthy skepticism, avoid attracting drama into your world when you travel. Keep your voice down, don't wear flashy stuff, and walk with intention. Most places aren't that dangerous unless you act like a mark. Don't be a fool, and foolish things won't happen to you. Number 10. The meals you remember are the cheap ones. 
When the bars and clubs let out in southern Turkey, there's an interesting late night food option. The baked potato vendor. It's a guy on a bike that has an oven on the back, and that's filled with piping hot baked potatoes. He puts out 15 different condiments like sour cream, cheese, and spicy peppers, and you get to top your tot however you want. It's kind of brilliant and delicious, and I have no idea why I've never seen this anywhere else. Also, the Pinchos in the Basque country of northern Spain were the best bar food I've ever had in my life. And I dig how they charge you by counting the number of toothpicks on your plate afterwards. Also, fresh bread and cheese is a delicious, portable, cheap way to get by on long train rides. And while I'm preaching all this frugality, the biggest waste of money in traveling? Hotel rooms. You're barely going to be there anyway. You just need a roof and a bed. Stay places that are cheap but passable. That way, you can treat yourself to a few extra days on the road. So those are my 10 tips, and here's a bonus one, number 11. Notice how it feels to be an outsider. Traveling loose like this frequently involves relying on the kindness of strangers. You need directions, suggestions, translations, and a decent exchange rate. People don't understand you, and you're no longer the center of the universe. It's a real ego check to depend on others to that degree. In fact, it can be downright humbling. But this isn't weakness, it's a muscle. It shifts your perspective, especially if, like me, you're a straight, white, American man. You start to look out for fellow travelers, even when you're back home. It makes you patient when someone is confused and helpful when someone is lost. You're never the same after you've been a stranger in a strange land. You go home, but you remain forever slightly strange. And that's a good thing. And now let's welcome in producer Jeremiah McVeigh. Hello, Jeremiah. Hey, Matt. So, really good list. I've been lucky enough to do some traveling. I wouldn't quite call myself a backpacker. I've done a little bit of it, but probably not as extensively as you. But I've gone to some pretty cool places. And for the most part, I think I agree with almost everything you said in the list. One caveat I would throw in, though, regarding the food. You said, like, uh, the the cheap meals are going to be the ones you remember. I think... Sometimes it's also the ones you would never get when you're home. And those can sometimes Mm -hmm. be the expensive ones. Because like I have a tendency in my normal everyday life, I don't go out to extravagant dinners unless it's like a very special occasion. You know, it's it's rare that I drop hundreds of dollars on a meal, say. But sometimes you hear about a restaurant in a certain country or some sort of an experience where it's going to cost you more than you would normally ever spend. And it doesn't always pay off, but sometimes it does. I've I've had that go both ways, I guess. But uh, sometimes you do remember those meals and it's partially because you're like, I would just never splurge like this at home. Um, but, but otherwise I do agree with you. I'm not saying that that cancels out, obviously, what you were saying. I think cheap meals are also great ones and often the ones that you remember just because they're usually a little closer to the ground where you are of like, this is what people eat here. And it's more the experience that you want to have. If you want to have like a real experience. Yeah. I think there's sort of like the Anthony Bourdain mentality of, you know, you're going to get something a little bit more real sometimes if you're eating street, street food or something that's more affordable. I also think, and I think this is especially true in the past, you know, 10 to 15 years, like expensive places around the world are becoming more and more homogenous. Mm. Like the expensive, you know, sort of restaurant in in one city looks exactly like the one in another city, and and you just sort of are getting this this generic luxury sort of experience or, or branding that isn't always unique to the place that you're from. Um, so I, I guess I'd be on the lookout for that. The other thing I'll mention too is is uh, and I, uh, to go back to the Bourdain thing, it's like who are you dining with? Right. Because a lot of times, if you're just solo at some fancy restaurant having an incredible meal, it's not going to be nearly as memorable as you know some you know being invited to someone's home where you get to dine with someone's family, even if it's you know a much less refined uh, meal that you're eating. Totally. Um, so the other point I wanted to circle back to was see things like a photographer. Um, I thought that was an interesting almost counterintuitive point in a way, because you go through life with so many people telling you, 
get off your phone, which is how most people take pictures now. So they're like, mm-hmm. experience the world instead of documenting it. But I do think that you're correct that when you're out traveling in a big way like that around the world, like seeing things that you never would have seen otherwise, um, it's it's good to reframe things. And a camera is an easy way to do that. Like, So I, I just liked that you put it that way. Because I do think that's something that I do, and probably a lot of people do, but they just don't think of it as explicitly as like, this is what's helping me figure out how to look at things. I think sometimes I like actually carrying a camera, but you know, obviously most people are just shooting on their phone, Mm -hmm. but I think it's almost thinking more about the output. I'm trying to get photographs. I'm trying to capture something unique and I'm trying to think about, you know, where I am the way a quote unquote real photographer would. And, you know, like I said, I feel like it just sort of like forces you into this different mindset where you're really like noticing things in a qualitatively different way. Like all of a sudden you're staring at, you know, shadows, you're like noticing, you know, textures on a building, you're, you're like looking for cool angles, you're like, oh, well, let's climb that tower that gives us a view of the entire city, because that will be a great shot. Like, you just, you know, have a different sort of philosophy almost as to how you're interacting with your environment when you're thinking about it like a photographer. And so for me, that's always been just a, a really cool sort of uh, way to interact with a place. And also, personally, I like to have a project, like even when I'm on vacation, mm-hmm. I'm still sort of itching to feel like I'm being productive in some vague way. And it's nice to be like, you know, sort of building memories as you go. And then at the end of that trip, when you do have that book, you know, especially if you're traveling with people, you can print up the book and give it to them too. And like uh, people, a lot of times are, they're very impressed and also appreciate like, oh, look at this cool, you know, book of photos that we have that really captures the vibe of this trip and the place we went. And so th- there's a variety of benefits to it, I think. Yeah. I think the idea of having a project while you're on the road has got to connect back to previous conversations about always having to be <laughs> on a grind to keep your name out there and stuff like that. It just, it's hard to shut that off, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. And now for some quickies. So I've never served in the military, but one time I accompanied my girlfriend of seven years to her younger sister's wedding. And let me tell you, it felt a lot like being on the front lines of something. Social media is a great place to watch people take jokes seriously. Seriously. We just had April Fool's Day, and it made me realize April Fool's Day is to comedians what New Year's Eve is to alcoholics. Amateur hour. Camouflage doesn't work. I keep seeing those dudes everywhere. You can subscribe to or follow this show just about anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you have a moment, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or anywhere else that allows you to do that. And when I say that, I mean, like, leave it a good review. I feel like that's obvious, but if, you, if you're just going to leave it a bad review, you, you don't have to. Anyway, it helps others find the show, which I really appreciate. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me at mattruby at hey.com. That's mattruby at H-E-Y dot com. And if you like this podcast, you should subscribe to the Rubes Letter, where what you just heard first appeared. You can find that at mattrubycomedy.com slash subscribe. And while you're at mattrubycomedy.com, you can also find links to my Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok, where I post clips of my stand-up and other stuff, too. Thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media. 